Welcome to Bicycle Retail Radio, the bicycle industry podcast that brings retailers, vendors, advocates, and thought leaders to the mic for honest discussions about the latest issues facing retailers while taking an in-depth look at the person within the profession. Great. Welcome to the Flex. Today is our Technician Flex. It's our newest addition to Bicycle Retail Radio. This is an ongoing feature focused specifically on service center and mechanics produced in partnership with NBDA educational partner Northwest Arkansas Community College Bicycle Assembly and Repair Technician Program. Uh, Benjamin Glenn is director of the program. He's with us today. Hi, Benjamin. Hi, how's it going? Awesome. Thanks for coming back. This is what episode number three, right? I believe you're right. Yeah. Looking forward to this one. I've been hearing lots of positive feedback. Uh, listeners, if you have not heard of the work that Benjamin's doing at Northwest Arkansas Community College with the Bicycle Assembly and Repair Technician Program, you should check it out. Um, whether you're a beginner, intermediate, or advanced cycling enthusiast, you can go to the college located in Northwest Arkansas near Bentonville, and you can, in a short time, or earn a Bicycle Industry Employers Association accredited certification in bicycle assembly and repair. You'll gain incredible skills in bicycle mechanics, wheel repair, assembly, bearing, suspension service, uh, suspension systems, service department operations, electric bikes, and more. Uh, we'll link in the show notes the topics that we cover on this flex are questions given to us from retailers. So listening yourself, you can submit any questions to us at any time. They can be on service department operations, mechanics training, bicycle assembly. Submit those questions to me at heather at nbda.com and we will answer them on the podcast. Ben, are you ready to dive in? I am, yes. I see in the background today, it looks like you're in the lab and I see you've got some bikes on the stands. How are things going? Uh, so we're on the back end of our semester. We actually were looking at the timeline yesterday, uh, myself and my colleague here. We just got like four weeks of instruction left for the semester to wrap up these uh, first five courses in our program. Uh, last week, we got into uh, a fantastic virtual clinic with SRAM. Uh, Vance uh, there in Colorado uh, Springs, I believe it is, uh, where he is. Uh, you know, he was he was on the screens. Uh, we have 12, 12 big screens. We did a virtual clinic with him on their electronic system. You know how that uh, SRAM axis and transmission was developed throughout the years. So, we, you know, we got a little bit of history uh, and then it was, um, you know, all, all kind of hands on and kind of running through some diagnostics and compatibility. And so now it's Shimano's turn. So we're going to get into DI2 this week. So we got these set up for students uh, starting Monday morning. We went through, uh, you know, kind of did a little bit of troubleshooting with a few of these to make sure they are, are ready to go and all of them are starting in the same. These are specialized Creo um, bikes behind here, behind me. They serve a lot of purposes like the dropper post, hydraulic uh, road disc brakes, carbon wheels, things like that. We're able to really tap into those at certain times throughout the semesters. Um, a lot of fun with these bikes, uh, e-gravel bikes. So we'll use this e-system in our elect uh, electric bicycles course starting in the spring as well. So we'll run through you know, all the things we can uh, electronic, uh, electronically uh, with that uh, e-system, you know, battery safe operations, you know, even down to like how to talk to customers, be good advocates of e-bikes as well. So I love to see a lot of our industry partners working with you and making sure that you have all the resources uh, and able to run a, a fantastic program there. I was recently in Bentonville and I met one of your students who was raving about his experience at the school and how much he has learned. So keep up the great work. Um, can you give me an update? I remember you had mentioned there's a trail building school in development, I, I think. How's that going, Ben? Yeah, uh, so we'll launch that next fall. Uh, right now, we, we literally this this week uh, or this coming week, uh, renovation on the rest of our building, which is off, off to my right. So we're in about a third of the building. The rest of the two thirds of the building will start going uh, undergoing renovation uh, to start equipping a, you know, a, a a lab, uh, not similar to ours, but very close. It'll have the screens, but instead of you know bike stands, it's actually going to have uh, welding machinery, things like that. It'll have uh, all, all the different necessary tools, chainsaws, all that good stuff. A couple of simulators, so students will be able to learn how to operate uh, everything from. Um, I think it'll simulate backhoes, it'll excavators, those things like that. So we we don't have to buy 
you know, multiple excavators or whatever it is, we can have two simulators and, and get students in there working that. It'll have a classroom space as well. So that space is just now getting um, underway with construction, renovation, all those things like that. Uh, as far as curriculum goes, that curriculum is still getting uh, developed uh, in partnership with uh, several uh, trail building associations around the U.S. and a couple of international. Uh, the uh, assessment testing has has been uh, established. Uh, so you know it's it's well on its way to starting out with some success, good quality, um, you know, starting point. So it's an amazing to resource to bring. It's an amazing resource to bring talented people into our industry, uh, whether in the mechanics field or for trail building. So the industry listeners definitely stay in tune to what's happening at the Northwest Arkansas Community College. All right, Ben, let's jump in. We got I think five or six questions today, lots of them. So the first one comes from a retailer. The question that they're asking us is actually. Uh, a question so they can provide an answer to their customers. Uh, they say it's getting colder and they're asking what the best way to store a bike inside for the winter is. I guess the options would be to hang it uh, straight up, maybe upside down, cover it up, maybe a certain degree temperature. So yeah, Ben, what do you think about that? Um, yeah, uh, you know, I, I like to first say riding in, in cold weather can Kind of be rewarding sometimes especially when you can dress appropriately for that definitely encourage folks to keep on riding give it a try maybe give it a try more than once you know experiment with some different layers and whatnot it actually is pretty nice uh you know i commuted uh, to my previous job for about five years just across town uh on my bike and, and, and loved it it was uh something i did uh you know as just you know being a good steward of, of the community and also just to, you know, uh, help my mental state uh, to stay stabilized a little bit, I guess. So uh, give it a try. Uh, so, so definitely encourage folks to, to keep on riding through, through maybe these chillier mornings, uh, something like that. But for storage, um, anytime you're going to store, store your bike for a long period of time, I think it's a good idea to go ahead and give that bike a nice clean, lubricate the things that need to be lubricated before storing, storing those, take some inventory of what might need to be serviced, Get those things taken care of before you go into storage. Your future self will definitely appreciate that uh, because when you pull that bike out, it'll be ready to go. You just have to air up the tires, you know, do your ABC, make sure everything, uh, you know, is functioning properly and then start riding it. So get your service done before. Uh, make sure that, you know, chains are lubricated, that, uh, you know, the bearings are, are in good working order. Everything is functioning properly, you know, and then store it away if you need to. Uh, you know, you got to consider the space you have. Uh, so make sure you, you, you clean up that space, clear it out, make room for the bike, depend, you know, uh, decide on how you want to store it as well. You know, are you going to store it, you know, hanging on a wall uh, vertically? Are you going to go ahead and flip it upside down and hang it from the ceiling? You know, if you're storing it inside, typically that is telling me that you're getting it to at least, you know, a room temperature, 65 degrees plus. So should be a okay on that. Uh, so, you know, uh, if you're going to be storing it in a garage or just cover, or, you know, just under like a covered area, I, I would try to cover that up just to keep, you know, some heat retention there, keep the dirt, debris, things like that off of those. Um, but, uh, you know, if it's going to be indoors, uh, that's that's probably the best place to put it. You don't have to cover it up if it's inside, you know, unless it's in a high traffic area, like a hallway or something like that. Then you might want to just, you know, so you're you're not rubbing up against, you know, uh, the, the lubrication on the train or something, or the chain. Um, so consider what type of bike rack you want. Um, ideally, you want to keep the Tires off the ground, you know, tubes, tires, they all lose air over time, even overnight. They try to, uh, you know, go to some type of equilibrium with the, uh, out, you know, with the environment there. Uh, so, you know, if you have a, a tire that's going flat over the course of three months, uh, just naturally going flat, it's going to end up creating some flat spots. So you need to remember that uh, either you're going to have to go in and air up those tires, check the tire pressure or get the tires off the ground somehow, um, you know, Tubeless is, is uh, susceptible to this as well, probably maybe a little bit quicker than, you know, a tube bike, um, especially with that sealant. If you have sealant in a tubeless system, uh, that sealant can dry out. You need to refresh that. If you don't plan on riding your bike at all, it might be a good idea to go ahead and remove as much of that sealant as possible. You might even consider just removing the tires complete, completely and storing those inside at a room temperature. So, um, you know, unfortunately, there'll be a little bit of... Uh, Redo, uh, you'll have to go through uh, to get those tires back up to uh, tubeless, but it'll be worth it. It'll save your tread. It'll save your tires uh, and, you know, keep you uh, from losing money on that sealant. Uh, sometimes people think that, you know, you're going to do some damage to hydraulic brakes. Uh, 
Typically, this isn't really something that needs to be concerned as long as those brakes are in good working order, meaning that you know there's not any air in those lines, that they're functioning properly. You're typically not going to do any damage to those if you hang them upside down. However, suspension components like a suspension front fork, uh, you, you know, if you hang it upside down, you can have some of that suspension fluid leak past what's called the foam seals. Just little uh, uh, and, and dust wipers. The, basically, the seals you can see from from the outside of the bike there, just just at where the uppers meet the lowers. So, um, you know, a little caution to that, but uh, you know. You shouldn't be doing any harm to the bike um, at all, hanging it upside down other than, you know, suspension there. You might see some fluid leaking out and, it, uh, you know, want to take care of that. But start out with a clean bike. Make sure you have the area uh, that you're going to store that ready to go so it's not just, you know, a mess, uh, you know, and you're, you're, you know, helping yourself out, just keeping it organized. Awesome. Thank you, Ben. That's a super detailed answer. I like how you started out with the just maybe layer up and get out, you know. But yeah. Uh, I actually bring my bike inside. I like to keep it indoors. So um, I love your tips. Thanks for that. Um, all right, let's keep rolling on. The next one, again, is from a retailer uh, asking us a question so he can best inform his customers. Uh, he sells a lot of Wahoo trainers. And the questions he's getting from his customers are, what kind of upkeep should I have on the bike if it's on the trainer? And then the other, the second part is, is it bad to get out of the saddle and be really aggressive on it? So, you know, all that torque I'm thinking must be the question. So I don't know, Ben, what do you think? Yeah. So, um, you know, this kind of makes me think back to, uh, you know, when, when everyone was um, kind of inside during the pandemic, we had a lot of folks that were you know, getting on the trainers, riding their bikes inside. Um, fantastic. You know, trainers are great. They're designed for indoor use. So feel free to use as needed, you know, um, it does take a little finesse to kind of get out of the saddle, be aggressive uh, on ro on trainers or rollers. Um, you know, it, it does take a little finesse, but, you know, they're made, they're designed for that as long as the trainer is set uh, to that bike. Uh, you know, you should should be okay with doing that. Hang a towel over the handlebars, over the headset to keep sweat out of these parts. Uh, you know, if you're indoors, it, it, even if you're indoors, you can wear some gloves to help soak up that sweat. A good pair of cycling shorts. You know, you're uh, the person on that bike, you're seated for a long period of that time on your indoor ride. A lot of folks think, oh, I'm just going to use my old shorts, uh, old old cycling bibs or, or whatever it is. Those typically are really worn outs. Uh, so it's a good idea to actually use your your better ones on that because you are seated for so long, off, off, you know, often. So, you know, 30, 45 minutes, hour, two hour ride inside, uh, you, you know, you're going to thank yourself for keeping your your shorts on there. Uh, you know, the nice shorts. Um it's a good idea to take the bike off the trainer ever so often, give it a wash, wash away the sweat, the grime uh, from your body. That stuff could be very corrosive to uh, to the different uh, fixing points along your shifters, your stem bolts, all that good stuff. At the very least, give it a good wipe down after you um, have been on, on the bike. So wipe your top tube down, your saddle, seat post, you know, all those places, anywhere that sweat can drip. That stuff is extremely corrosive. Uh, and it can actually be kind of toxic um, as well. Uh, so once it dries out uh, without going too much, but it's got uric acid in it um, and it, it can do some damage to the handlebars, uh, to different, uh, you know, threaded fasteners, that kind of stuff. Uh, so so be careful, uh, you know, wipe the sweat down, you know, train yourself a little bit to, to get out of the saddle. You know, that bike is obviously not going to move with you. So keep that in mind. Maybe, you know, if you're going to be aggressive on it, start small and, you know, work your way into to a little bit, uh, you know, more aggressive, but, um, you know, I've seen, I've seen some, some pretty, uh, pretty bad things with, uh, sweat, uh, corroding handlebars to the point where the handlebars are basically falling apart. So be careful. I love this advice. Uh, disclaimer, it takes a little finesse, you know, to ride. The it does. Yeah. And I've definitely seen some bikes come in and, uh, you can tell that they've been sweat, sweated on. So okay. yeah, great advice, Ben. Thank you for that. Um, all right, let's keep going. This one is from a retailer in Florida. Uh, I know the retailer well, and he wanted to know if you have any strategy for minimizing the chance that a customer will try to hold you responsible for problems that arise on their bike after it leaves your shop, if the problems had nothing to do with the work you did for them. So let's say they have tubeless mm -hmm. tires, they're working fine. They brought the bike in. All you did was adjust the brakes. They get home. The tubeless tires are, you know, they they go flat. I don't know. So yeah. what happens there? Any any tips there? 
Yeah, I definitely want to know a little bit more about this. Um, you know, this could be as simple as the elements involved in the service being performed. You know, for instance, like you said, you know, I get a bike in, I remove the wheels, weed the brakes, neglect to check brake pad and rotor wear, you know, then that's that's on me. You know, I had the wheels off. Brake pads and rotors are part of that and should be part of that uh, brake lead service. You know, but if I bleed the brakes, customer has a flat a month later due to a thorn, nail, whatever it is, has nothing to do with the brake bleed I performed. Uh, you know, that's that's not something that, you know, me as the shop owner or the service tech can, can cover. Uh, you know, unfortunate things happen. Uh, a good rule here is, you know, confirm the service being performed on the bike with the customer present. Get their approval and expectations, you know, not only once, but twice. Ask them twice. So we have your permission to do these things. Great. Wonderful. Here's here's your estimates. So how does this sound to you? Let me know how this sounds. You know, get that. Yes, this looks great. Signatures never hurt. A signature from the actual service rider, whoever's checking that bike in, uh, and also from the customer can help as well. They take some ownership in dropping that bike off. They know they're signing that to perform that work. Uh, it, it always goes a, a long way in just speaking to your professionalism as a shop. Yeah, Ben, I love it. This is part of what you're educating the students there at, at the community college as well, right? It's not just mechanics. It's also how to deal with all these issues that arise within the service department. Correct. Yes. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, the next one is, is very similar lines, uh, but it comes from a retailer up uh, in Michigan. He says, how do you address the uncertainty of what a repair at the time the ticket is written up uh, or, or the uncertainty of what a repair needs? So mm -hmm. like, let's say you don't know that there might need be parts or additional services that are required. So how do you address that, uh, you know, at the time of intake? Yeah, sure. That makes sense. You know, uh, you, you get a bike, you think it, uh, you know, has these particular parts inside, you know, behind that, you know, uh, tube or whatever you're looking at there. there, there might be more going on with that than, you know, that inspection is going to confirm, uh, you know, but the idea here is that you're always confirming the uh, expe expectations from the customer. You know, what do they expect? You know, you're approaching that customer first as a customer, as, as a person, and then you're talking about the bike too. So you've already built that relationship up. So, you know, the expectations uh, of that service with the customer before they leave the bike for repair, you know, there should be no sur surprises when the customer returns to pick up their bike. So that estimate, you know, could, could include some of those pieces, you know, Hey, this is an estimate. We could al also find these, you know, X, Y, and Z. This is where your, your service advisor should be, you know, technically savvy as well as have those soft skills needed to build that relationship with the customer. So for example, you know, uh, you could say, hi, customer, I have the estimate, you know, to fix your bike. The estimate for labor and parts is this. And, you know, this is just an estimate. I'll give you a call if it's, you know, whatever amount over, X, X amount over the estimate. So $25 over. How does this sound to you? Is that okay? Do I have your permission? If so, you know, move on. If not, you know, you can, you know, uh, reevaluate and, and talk with that customer over the things that might stick out, talk, you know, red flags for them, you know, okay. No is an answer, but no doesn't mean that, you know, things can't be fixed. So. Yeah. Yeah. That, I think that clarity is a great uh, example of how we could do it. Right. And let the customer know that there may be additional charges. Absolutely. Um, all right. Last question, Ben, we're almost through today. We're doing it. Um, this one is around e-bike uh, resources. And the question is what resources are available for bicycle mechanics to learn to become excellent e-bike technicians? Mm. Yeah, that's great. You know, e-bikes are the fastest growing, almost sometimes only growing category, depending on when you're looking at, uh, you know, bicycle sales. Uh, so I think, you know, it, it, let's let's first uh, separate e-bike here. You know, there's the bike itself, brakes, drive train, wheels, the things we're familiar with as, as long, uh, you know, long-term mechanics here. And then we have the e-system in itself, battery, motor, sensors, wiring harness, uh, you know, different connection, connection points along that uh, system itself. Typically, there's there's only so far we can go with the e-system, and there's only so far we should go with e-system service. Uh, professional e-system services is very dependent on the recommendations from the manufacturer of that e-system. So, you know, Bosch versus another, you might have some, uh, you know, differences of if what actually can be serviced right there in the service department without spe specific, uh, you know, training around those. So. E, 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 I'm sorry, getting tongue tied here. E-bike specific training for techs is more than just reading the manual. 
You want to talk with your e-bike vendor to understand what they offer for professional development and training. Look to some of the other leaders in e-bikes as well. Uh, you know, I'm thinking like uh, our friends over at UL Solutions, you know, even if you're not a vendor of their bikes, you know, they're still, they still, uh, you know, might offer some type of training to you. So, um, you know, the, everyone's kind of in the, um, in that same boat. They want to have highly qualified technicians working on their products. So they're going to have, uh, you know, if you speak to those, I was just on the phone actually with Microshift earlier today, you know, trying to work through some problems. Um, you know, Microshift, we have mostly Shimano SRAM in here. I've got a few Microshift things and they absolutely wanted to support me, support what we're doing here with some technical documents and things that, you know, are, are available to the dealers only. So it was great to get that feedback. Just gave them a call on the phone said, hey, here's, here's what we're going through. Can you help me out? They gave me a few uh, kind of hacks, if you will, to uh, fix fix a few things we've had go on. So uh, recommend, you know, tapping into some some resources, like I said, over at UL Solutions. Even Human Power Solutions has some, some great opportunities there to just dive a little bit deeper into that. Sometimes it'll take a little bit digging around, but connecting yourself with that manufacturer, with your vendor, and say, hey, what do you have available for training? I want my techs to be uh, very knowledgeable and highly qualified with your products. I could not agree more with that. There's so much there. And I agree that there's only so far we can go, but there's a lot of parts on the bike itself that we can work on too. So it's important to get all the information. Um, I guess I do have one more question for you. Uh, sure. I don't know if you know this, I'm sure you do, but uh, New York City is considering a standardized e-bike mechanics training or let's say a certification to be required. How do you feel about that? Like, have you heard about that? And, and what are your thoughts about that? Yeah, I, I've read some high, uh, so some uh, headliners about that. You know, New York City Council, you know, focus, you know, on having, you know, even delivery apps provide workers with certified e-bike battery training of some sort certification. You know, Brose has got their e-bike system technical training uh, for U.S. retailers and U.S. service provider, uh, providers that, you know, just was made an announcement, I think, actually yesterday on Brain. Um, so I, I don't think this is irrational. This is definitely the way it's going to go. Uh, you can look at the CPSC's involvement with lithium ion batteries, lithium ion battery uh, powered uh, vehicles as well. You know, the the uh, this is a little bit more reactive. I think, you know, uh, as an industry, this is something if, if you're not been keen to e-bikes, it, it shouldn't be a surprise. Um it's a little reactive to a much broader issue, though, I feel like, as both, you know, both of us know, uh, the concerns are not just e-bikes and techs who service these systems. It's kind of a, a systematic um, concern here. You know, we have kind of antiquated, outdated policies that don't necessarily address modern technology. And I think right now it's coming to uh, uh, to a point where we need to start doing that and start uh, addressing some some of the policies that might not address the modern bike and, and the service that we can provide that modern bike. You know, there's a lot of complexities, compatibility, you know, as a technician, compatibility is kind of the name of the game. You know, you shifter with your derailleur just because it says SRAM or Shimano or or, or Microshift or, or whatever on there doesn't mean it's always going to work out. You know, uh, there's, there's specifics that you have to look into on that. So as far as tech training, certification, education, we, we as an industry still have time to pull some research resources, stay ahead of, you know, these forced policies or regulations that might not have the in industry's best interest in them. Time is running out, you know, programs like the one I'm in, Ron's program at UBI, Project Bike Tech with Jeff Donaldson are all industry backed in some form or fashion. We've all got support. I had, uh, you know, great relationships with uh, Shimano and SRAM and Magura. Uh, Bosch as well coming in, Fox Sports uh, with their suspension. You know, we've, we've got some great relationships that we're building, and those are extremely important so that we can stay on top of the products that they have, what they're manufacturing, and they continue to support uh, you know these already established educational bicycle technician programs, not just the one here, but like I said, UBI, Project Bike Tech as well. Uh, some of those programs like that, we're, we're getting support. So let's continue to, to support these. And the time's really never been better to start going into a total industry alignment of where we stand on e-bikes, on technician service, on the training, on the certification of what we all love, which is, you know, bicycles and riding our bicycles, right?
Yeah, I love to hear your uh, your thoughts on that, and and I couldn't agree more. And I'm so happy to see Jeff Donaldson over at Project Bike Tech, and looking forward to all that he will bring to that organization. So 100%, the time has never been better. Um, look at us keeping it within 30 minutes today, Ben. Thank you so much for for yeah. another fabulous technician flick flex. Um, that wraps it up. You know, as always, we'll have this episode. Listeners, if you're listening in the car, you can go over to the MBDA YouTube channel and you can see our awesome faces. You can see the Creos hanging up behind uh, Benjamin in the, the lab. Uh, ben, thanks again for your time and dedication to the industry and all you're doing. Yeah, I look forward to this each time we record. Thanks for what you're doing there at NBDA. Super fun. All right, listeners, if you'd like to have your questions answered on the flex, any questions at all relating to bicycle service center mechanics training, bicycle assembly, uh, put those questions over to me at Heather at NBDA, and then Ben and I will get through them and get them on the flex. Thanks for listening. Now go be great. Thank you for listening to Bicycle Retail Radio. This podcast is designed specifically for the bicycle industry dedicated to strengthening our retailers and cycling community. If it is your first episode, we urge you to take the time and listen to our past episodes. 